Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Dave Leventhal in the bullpen today, Raw Story, editor in chief, one of my favorite publications. And we're going to talk about something they've uncovered. Marjorie Taylor Greene in violation again, again, and again. All right. Uh, this is a hell of a story, man. So, for those who may not know what the reporting has been about, can you set it up for us and then we'll get into the weeds of it? Well, back in 2021, which may seem like a political eon ago, Marjorie Taylor Greene was out fundraising for a super PAC, one of those organizations that can raise and spend unlimited amounts of money. And we found out just this past couple of days ago that she had actually been fined $12,000 by the Federal Election Commission, which is not known for fining politicians all that often, okay? It's a very divided, bifurcated, bipartisan body that oftentimes is gridlocked. And yet they were able to agree to find Marjorie Taylor Greene for illegal fundraising in regards to ads that she had promoted and she had cut for this super PAC during Georgia's special election back then. And uh, you know what we found out too, though, and this is kind of the kicker, is that Marjorie Taylor Greene, even though she was personally fined by the Federal Election Commission, meaning that ostensibly she would have to pay the fine, when we got a copy of the check from the Federal Election Commission, which we did at Raw Story, it showed that the money that she had paid came from her campaign, not from her own bank account. Can we talk about that for a minute? Because it seems to be counterintuitive to the rules. I know there's this insinuation that, well, because she would not have incurred the fine or the penalty, um, if she had not been a candidate. And so because of that interplay, uh, this, this is excusable. And I completely disagree. What is the sentiment um, from this story about how this process worked out in the payment of the fine? Well, you're right. Uh, the, the legality here, if you want to parse the, the legal particulars, is that Marjorie Taylor Greene didn't violate a law again by having her campaign foot the bill for this $12,000 fine, which I should note, there was a vote of five to one. And even two Donald Trump Republican appointees on the Federal Election Commission agreed in principle that Marjorie Taylor Greene had violated this particular election law involving the the advertisements that she had done. but. Put yourself in the mind of a Marjorie Taylor Greene supporter. And I suspect many people will <laughs> be very scared about doing so. But that being <laughs> said, if you're a donor to Marjorie Taylor Greene and you've given $100 or you've given $1,000 and you're expecting that that money is going to, of course, help Marjorie Taylor Greene get elected or, you know, at minimum, have Republicans supported by that money so that you can own the libs and beat the Dems. You might be surprised to find out that, in fact, your money was going to pay for a fine that Marjorie Taylor Greene had personally incurred and then used her campaign committee to cover the bill. Now, that's probably not going to bother at least some people who think that Marjorie Taylor Greene can do no wrong. But there are probably others who are maybe scratching their heads a little bit reading these headlines and saying, well, you know, I, I suspect there was a higher and better use of my money than what ultimately that money went toward. You know, and I think that's accurate for free thinking people. Uh, but we have seen a cult like behavior in the psychological expression of many Trump supporters and also by proxy Marjorie Taylor Greene supporters. And I would take us back to the days of Stephen A. Banner when he, Stephen Banner, when he was uh, fundraising to build a wall, a complete lie, took the money to different bank accounts that eventually routed back to him. He got caught, right? You did not see the overwhelming off with his head, give me my money back. I've been manipulated, economic fraud, etc. Now, if this would have been in the context of taxation, there's a problem. But as long as certain people are stealing, there's no problem. I don't understand this dynamic. What has the response been since the reporting? Do you have a sense that there are people who support or supported Marjorie Taylor Greene? They're now saying, wait a minute. Now, I, I want my money back because I don't want it to go toward this. Well, we don't have a whole lot of evidence, at least at this juncture, that Marjorie Taylor Greene supporters are calling her office or sending emails saying, hey, you know, what, what gives here? I, I want my money back. 
But I do think that this is an example that underscores the fact, and, and a fact that oftentimes is forgotten by the body politic, that there are guidelines, there are rules, there are laws that govern the way that money flows through this very laissez-faire political money system that we have kind of put together chock-a-block over the past many decades. And, and that's, you know, you can talk about Citizens United and super PACs and, you know, all the different court cases and the, the different rulings at the Federal Election Commission and laws that Congress has passed and all that put together. If you were drawing up a system from scratch, it would not look anything like this. It couldn't yeah. look anything like this. But yet, that all being said, too, you still do have rules in place and candidates are subject to those rules. And sometimes the rules are more or less ignored, but in other cases, and this being one of them, the, the rules when they are broken, the the bodies that are put in place, the agencies, uh, the regulators, they, they do have a say in all of this. And hey, look, if it wasn't for campaign finance rules, which may not seem like the sexiest thing in the world all the time, uh, we, we wouldn't have probably one of the four different criminal cases that Donald Trump is now facing. Yeah. So. Money in politics is not interesting until it gets really darned interesting. And we, we've got with Marjorie Taylor Greene, one of those cases right in our midst right now this week. Dave, you're editor in chief of uh, Raw Story. I've been the editor of a mid-size um, news publication myself. And I know that there's a business balance associated with that leadership role. So let me take you to just a very simple business dynamic with politics. Generally speaking, someone running for office, they're not to use campaign money for personal benefit at all. That rule is standard. We have seen candidates who did not get elected prosecuted for this, and we have seen members of Congress who did get elected prosecuted for this. How is it that all of a sudden we blur the lines when it comes to a personal fine? based on personal behavior. Help me understand the splitting of the hairs with this. And Ross Story has several lawyers about this. And what the conclusion generally was, was that this kind of walked up to the line of personal use, but it didn't cross it. And you mentioned why a moment ago, that Marjorie Taylor Greene, Basically, the FEC says if you're a candidate and you're you're operating even in a illegal fashion, but in the context of being a candidate, that it doesn't violate the personal uh, the personal use rule that is in place. So let's put it this way: If Marjorie Taylor Greene had taken that twelve thousand dollars from her campaign and she went and she bought a new car that she was just using, or a down payment on a, a new Lexus that she was using just for her personal use, or she paid a mortgage payment, or or her cable bill, or anything of that sort, uh, she would be in trouble, and that would be a pretty cut and dried situation. This a little less so. But we have chapter and verse of different times all throughout the years. And we can think of Jesse Jackson Jr., the former mm -hmm. congressman, and John Edwards, and William Jefferson, and a whole slew of Republicans, too, who have gotten into trouble because they decided to one extent or another that they were going to use campaign dollars that they had raised for the specific purpose of being a candidate for Congress or another office for their own personal use. And that gray area, it, it would be nice if it was really black and white, but there is a gray area. And that gray area oftentimes is gonna be determined as to whether the, the blackness or the whiteness of it in a court of law. And that's what we see time and time again. You know, my one of my law school professors would have said, this is a bright line issue that has been basically made up by an administrative committee. And the bright line issue is they're going to interpret a penalty or a fine to be allowable um, as far as being paid by this particular uh, method. But if you were to take money to, let's say, do something else personal, um, no. And do you think that maybe because the money is coming back to a governmental authority has anything to do with their, let's just say, liberal ap approach to the method? Because I can make an argument for, let's go to Jesse Jackson Jr. The argument initially was, hey, listen, he bought a lot of clothes. Um, but he, he needed them. He was running uh, for US Congress or in his reelection bid, or he was um, having to do all these speaking engagements. And it was basically um, an allowance for his um, clothing bill. 
uh, which is kind of a uniform in the US Congress. So that was an argument. Many said that's a frivolous argument. Just like I would say Marjorie Taylor Greene's argument is a frivolous argument because she misbehaved in order to get a penalty. How far does it go, dear brother? If she's driving and she decides to speed, but she needs to get to a campaign event on time, is that permissible to use campaign money to pay for the speeding ticket? Where do <laughs> we draw the line, brother? And that's why we have this regulatory body in place to answer those thorny <laughs> questions. And there have actually been some pretty novel questions that have come before the FEC over the past several years. One in particular dealt with, of all things, child care, which is maybe not the first thing or 17th thing that you're thinking of when you're talking about political candidates. But you have young mothers and young fathers who are running for Congress. And it's very difficult for them to do so at the level that they want to or to be competitive in a race if they're say the parent of two young children, okay? I'm a dad, I know how hard it is to work when you got a nine year old, so I can appreciate that. And so did the Federal Election Commission. And in fact, in a unanimous decision not long ago, decided that yes, you could in fact use campaign funds to a certain amount to go and pay for childcare for that specific purpose. Health insurance is another thing too, even salaries for members, not members of Congress, but congressional candidates who wanna become members of Congress. These are some of sort of the almost workplace issues that are being dealt with by the Federal Election Commission. I should note too that the Federal Election Commission oftentimes we mentioned this before, does not agree on things that do seem like slam dunks, that do yeah. seem like bright line issues. And that is kind of the nature of the Federal Election Commission, which was created in the aftermath of Watergate in the mid 70s to try to be a, a, an umpire, a, a, call, a, a ball, caller of balls and strikes, but didn't quite work out that way. And that's what happens when you have a truly bipartisan commission, three Republicans, three Democrats trying to hash it out in a time like this when Republicans and Democrats can barely agree that there are 50 stars on the US flag. Yeah, um, I agree 100% on that. Um, once again, revealed donors foot the bill for Marjorie Taylor Greene's election law violation. I have to ask you about this story because we covered it today on Indisputable. Uh, once again, Marjorie Taylor Greene showing nude pics. Um, and this is all about sensationalism. This has nothing to do with the business of Congress. But the reality is there's such low, low approval. There's such a low approval of Congress. There's such a lack of faith in Congress that we expect it to be a clown show. And when we don't get one, we're surprised. But when we get one, we understand it as almost normative. What say you about the new tactics by Marjorie Taylor Greene um, and some others who are now doing these very sensational things rather than doing what they were elected to do? And that's very serious business of the nation. Well, none of this is surprising for Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, this is the whole nature of how she operates and how it's how she operates her campaigns. It's how she got elected to Congress in the first place by, by having an audience for that, a very receptive one in her district that thought that this was great that you had somebody who was going to, to, to break all the China in the China shop, be the ultimate bull, if you will, for the cause of the GOP, for MAGA, for Republicans. And we've seen this time and time again from her. We talk about the fine today, about the $12,000 fine for the illegal advertising, but that's not the only fine that she's faced up to over the past couple of years. Let's go back to the, the middle of the pandemic when there were mask regulations in Congress. Well, she got fined yep. over and over and over again. The last number I saw was north of $90,000 fines from Congress for just simply violating it and refusing to go along with what most everyone else, Republicans and Democrats were doing at that time in Congress holding up to that standard. So standards don't seem to apply to Marjorie Taylor Greene and Marjorie Taylor Greene's own mind. And that may be absolutely ridiculous to many Democrats and liberals and independent minded independents. But for some of the people who are in the Republican Party, certainly for Marjorie Taylor Greene's base, this is just another opportunity for her to just poke her finger in the eyes of the enemy, which are Democrats, which are liberals, and they love it. This is great. This is the attraction and the allure for them to Marjorie Taylor Greene. And that's why she's almost certainly gonna win reelection and did last time, despite the fact that she had a Democratic challenger who himself raised almost $15 million to go ahead and try to knock her off and failed miserably in the process. Yeah, um, and here's the thing, you know, she gets paid a a good salary, members of Congress get paid a good salary. Um, she has about 900,000 in her account off season. You know, that's just war chest money. And still, it seems as if she's able 
to do these really extreme things, go out and raise a bunch of more money. Because I guarantee you, um, even with this, she's going to say, "Oh my goodness, I'm being attacked. Please give me some more money." And that has become the cause and effect relationship. Every um, we say negative story, but it's just a truthful story that is perceived negative because of the context of it and because of the truth. But they're able to utilize that now, utilize that energy in order to um, animate their donors and animate their supporters in a way that honestly, man, I've worked in politics 15 years. I haven't seen it this polarized in my uh, career as a political um, analyst. What say you? If dogma trumps truth, mm -hmm. then it's very difficult to, to argue a counterpoint. And yeah, that's, that's I think right. what we're seeing to a great degree. Now you, you, you can accuse the extremes on both sides of that, but certainly it, you're seeing it in uh, the fashion that you are right now through Donald Trump, through Marjorie Taylor Greene, to a lesser extent, a, a Jim Jordan or Lauren Boebert, where you, you just simply have acolytes of those politicians, those candidates who are unwilling to step away from the notion that those candidates could in fact be fallible. And, yeah. and that's where you're at. So. And the only way to fight that is to, uh, to of course, have a candidate uh, on the other side or e even intramurally within a Republican primary kind of uh, situation that, that can offer a, a better idea or a better solution to the nation's problems, to a district's problems, be it what it may. Yeah, you know, to me, man, as long as Donald Trump is a standard bearer de facto of the Republican Party, uh, we will always have this kind of polarization and chaos. He had to shrink. The Republican Party had to shrink the committee because he could never he could never bear the standard. So when your standard bearer cannot bear the standard, the only way that person can survive politically is to shrink everything around him to fit him. That has been my opinion since day one with Trump. Uh, for those who are watching, uh, please let them know how they can follow the great work of Raw Story. Absolutely, go to rawstory.com. Please sign up uh, to our newsletter and subscribe if you will. All that money. Supports our new investigative team that we put together in the past year, which is doing some incredible, original, exclusive investigative work uh, that we're very, very proud of. And I think you will be too. Thank you to you and the team. You're welcome. Thank you.